And welcome back to Janky AF and Year of the Aerostar, episode number 102. Well, we are back. It's been a while. Uh, I apologize. I've been uh, working myself right down to the bone um, with a lot of uh, other pursuits, running a business and yada, yada, yada. I won't get into it, uh, but I've missed talking about Aerostars. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed that little broke YouTuber part two. Certainly got a lot of love. I very much appreciate that. If you have not watched it, you may find it entertaining. It's very short and uh, dense and compact. Uh, but the reason we are here today is to talk about Ford Aerostars, so we should probably get to that. So here we have a 1987 Ford Aerostar listed again in Latvia. The country of Latvia. Yes, uh, famous uh, home of NBA star Chris Stapps Porzingis. Keep calm like and uh, lots of other things too, but that's uh, certainly my, um, you know, first real connection. I have been to Latvia, actually. I've been to Riga while passing through on my way to uh, Vilnius in Lithuania. So shame on me for butchering the Latvian language so uh, poorly, and shame on me for calling it a Slavic language. It is not a Slavic language. Uh, I got a great uh, message from uh, our friend who uh, first sent me the images of the first Ford Aerostar in Latvia. Two Ford Aerostars in Latvia for sale. I mean, they're doing better than a lot of, you know, much larger European countries. Um, he said, absolutely butchered my language, have never heard anything like that. But then there was like a laughing emoji. Um, not a Slavic language, though, but it's okay. A common misconception. So I am not the only person to have called it a Slavic language. And... Uh, I'm actually going to go so far as to do a little bit of a deep dive here. So yes, this is Year of the Aerostar, but since we're in Latvia, um, we will take some time to learn a little bit about the Latvian language. Um, also known as Lettish, which is obsolete, is an Eastern Baltic language. So of course, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, and Estonia are the Baltic states, and it is considered a Baltic language belonging to the Baltic branch of the Indo-European language family spoken in the Baltic region. It is the language of Latvians and the official language of Latvia, as well as one of, one of the official languages of the European Union. There are about 1.2 million Latvian native, native Latvian speakers in Latvia and 100,000 abroad, which is interesting because that means there are fewer native Latvian speakers than there were Aerostars produced. Of course, how many Aerostars are left over? <laughs> well, it's probably right around the number of uh, Latvian speakers. So uh, Latvians and Aerostars, a perfect match. Altogether, 2 million or 80% of the population of Latvia spoke Latvian in the 2000s before the total number of inhabitants of Latvia slipped to less than 1.9 million in 2022. Okay, so you're right around the, um, the, the Aerostar production figure. Okay, as a Baltic language, Latvian is most closely related to neighboring Lithuanian as well as Old Prussian, an extinct Baltic language. Uh, so, there you go. Now, Slavic languages, just as our counterpoint here, uh, also known as Slavonic languages, are Indo-European languages as well, most, spoken primarily by the Slavic people and their descendants. Um, they are thought to descend from a proto-language called Proto-Slavic, during the early Middle Ages, which in turn is thought to have descended from the earlier Proto-Balto-Slavic -Balt language, linking the Slavic languages to the Baltic languages in a Balto-Slavic group within the Indo-European family. So maybe they are, you know, somewhat related. You know, I have to think of my faux pas of um, calling Latvian a Baltic or a Slavic language, excuse me, is very, very similar and analogous to a lot of people who come up to me with great enthusiasm and talk about um, the uh, Astro vans or Astro Star vans that I like and own and talk about. So, um, you know, I have to empathize a little bit with that. 
because uh, I try to always handle that situation with grace and our friend here um, in Latvia has certainly handled me with grace and I appreciate that. So janky do thank you. So quick little history lesson here on Year of the Aerostar, but let's get to this van. Okay, 1987, um, very, very 80s here, obviously, but first we should probably go through the facts and figures real quick. Listed for 4,500 euro. So not a, not a small amount of money in the Aerostar world. 4,500 euro, I am ready today, is $4,833.22. So pushing five grand for this Aerostar. Um, also, it has 114,622 kilometers, which equals only 71,000 miles. So you're getting... You know, we'd have to do the math. That was one thing I didn't do. But, you know, from 1987 till now, average that out. It's it's not going to be very many miles a year. You're looking at like three or 4,000 miles a year um, for how old this car is. And that's pretty impressive. It looks to be in fantastic condition, just like the last one. And the last one was that, I believe it was a 94. It was a sport. It had the white wall thing going on and the two-tone and the fog lights. And it was just perfectly encapsulated the 90s. This one to me perfectly encapsulates the 80s. And that is the cool thing about the Aerostar is that, you know, from like a Radwood classic uh, 80s, 90s um, perspective, the Aerostar is kind of like, like in all other aspects, this sort of dual purpose vehicle, because if you get one from, you know, 92 to 97, um, especially a sport model, something like that, or an Eddie Bauer edition. It's it just sort of like really is really encapsulates the nineties. Like I've said in the eight, in the anything 86 to 89, you know, with this grill or particularly 86 through 88, because then it had the original grill on it. Um, uh, and the, the two tone paint job with, especially with the silver. And as, as you notice, I am wearing my blue over silver, uh, two tone today. So, you know, little, little, pat on the back for not only color coordinating but actually color coordinating in two-tone now this does have a little beautiful red pinstripe i don't know if i have red anywhere on me but that's okay looks like it is like the xl or xlt model which i love that badging and this little red pinstripe you know i gotta say i don't remember these early two-tone vehicles as having body matched uh, bumpers. So I, again, the last one seemed like they, they took a few liberties with the paintwork and it had been kind of worked on a little bit. This one, I wonder if that's the same, although it's possible, you know, some of you out there know much more about the, the, the finer minute details of Aerostars than I do. Um, so let me know if this, if you think that this is a, a, you know, factory blue painted bumper, just a lovely, lovely shade of blue. And you know, as much as I love Jank and Patina, I just, you know, the latest issue of Haggerty Drivers Club just came out, and it's a whole issue just about Patina and arguing for and against it. I love Patina. I always say on my Brown Arrow Star, it took the sun like 30 years to paint this. Why would I ruin such a masterpiece by, by painting it back to like a, you know, perfect factory color? But the, the thing I will say for, you know, these incredibly well-preserved time capsules when you have paint that's still in such nice condition the way it just glistens in the sun really does service to what this vehicle um, looked like when it was fresh and new and in terms of a car taking you back and being sort of a time capsule you can almost more fully appreciate how cool this must have been when it came out and how different looking it was and how new looking it was and how futuristic looking it was because of this beautiful uh, shiny paint. Now, I'm, I, I do wonder if this has been um, painted again. It certainly has the, the low enough mileage to sort of make me believe it could be original paint. But then again, even on these two tones, these early two tones, like, you know, like 86 through 88 with the original grill, I don't ever remember the, the bumpers being body colored. I could be wrong about that. Actually, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, I think the brown over golds may have had some brown bumper. So maybe this is perfectly stocked from the factory. Um, we have these beautiful Hercules tires and it looks like maybe even a little blue painted um, center cap there, uh, which again, just adds to the look. I mean, everything is really dialed in here. These big kind of fat chunky tires, these steel truck-like wheels. 
um, that were a lot. I believe my 86 Aerostar is the exact same wheels, not in nearly as nice condition. Even the wheels are in nice condition. I mean, everything. Now this does have, the one thing that would maybe sort of really take this over the top would be the towing, the truck style towing mirrors. This does have your normal passenger mirrors on it, which look absolutely fine. Um, and quite frankly, are probably a little bit more aerodynamic. But that would be the one sort of accessory that I could see really bringing this thing into, you know, absolute peak 80s. Uh, so car body minivans. I'm not, so after that last episode, I'm not going to, I'm not going to even attempt to butcher any more Latvian. I think I've done enough damage. Um, and quite frankly, it just, we're not getting anywhere. So I'm just going to, I pulled up the English version of this ad. Um, now if you go to car equipment, there is some more Latvian. And the one thing I'll say that is weird is under Geismas, Spoglai, Spogel and Trosiba, uh, we have, it says something about airbag. Now, I'm pretty sure this 87 uh, didn't have an airbag. I don't think airbags really came, you know, into like the early 90s. Um, so I'm guessing this doesn't have an airbag, but I thought that was interesting that it says that under car equipment. Under description, Ford Aerostar 3.0 benzines, you know, three liter gas. Vesturiska. Specrata status piskerts leads. Then it says 1302 2024. It's always confusing because in Europe they do the date and the month backwards. So, you know, over here we would say February 13th, 2024. They say the 13th of February. Now, I'm wondering if this means it's like somehow registered or inspected until 2024, which would be pretty cool. Um, fuel type gasoline, engine capacity three, which is funny. Year 1987, gearbox automatic, it is an automatic, not a standard shift. And the color, which is also interesting, is uh, Geisi Zila, which maybe that means blue over silver, I'm not sure. Uh, let's look at some more pictures. Uh, and this, again, this, this website, I'm not in love with the way they scroll through pictures, but that's okay. Um, boy, oh, you know, this is really funny. Could, here we... You know, this is a great mystery to me of the Aerostar because I was always told and I've read that 86 and 87, the two engine options were the, 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 the 2.3 liter inline four fuel injected and the 2.8 liter Cologne V6, the four is the Lima, the, the Cologne V6 carbureted. So I thought that the three liter was only available starting in 1988. And when you see this little electronic fuel injection badge, I thought that was only on the four cylinders um, because the, the six cylinder that was offered at the beginning of this car's lifetime was uh, carbureted. This is the, I've seen an 86 that claimed to have the three liter in it, and this is an 87 that claims to have the three liter in it. So, you know, maybe even after 86, the maybe, the 86 is 87 I can see you know okay people were complaining about the engine options and the four cylinder was so underpowered that they decided to put a three liter in here and they kept the fuel injection badge because um because it was fuel injected so they could you know keep that badge I thought that was only for the four cylinder but you know maybe the three liter really did creep in earlier than you know, than Wikipedia claims. So I, I'm still waiting for the final, you know, definitive um, response on that. But we've seen enough anecdotal evidence now that I think that uh, maybe the the three liter V6 did work its way into this vehicle earlier than um, sort of the official record would ha would have us believe. I like this little uh, additional light here. Again, the silver paint and this blue, it, 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 you know, it almost looks like a Corvette Nassau blue, um, quite a bit actually. And that's not necessarily my favorite color and silver is not necessarily my favorite car color, but in combination, they look absolutely stunning, I must say. And just the, the quality of the paintwork generally and this uh, beautiful little pinstripe here. Of course, your Latvian license plate. Um, very, very nice. And one thing I absolutely love, and I, I kind of touched on earlier about these early Aerostars, is I love the badging on the front quarter panel. It's much more sports car-like to me. Um, and later it would move back here, um, right where your sort of fuel injection logo is. And that looks good too, don't get me wrong, but I just love it on this front quarter panel. So that's another very sort of 80s thing. 
Um, again, the two-tone looks really good with the back hatchback. You do have a rear wiper, which was quite nice in 1987. Um, and, you know, just drink it in, you know, very, very nice. Now these little, um, the bumpers, the earlier bumpers also had these, looks like we do have a little bit of bumper repair that's gone on here, no big deal. These, these are notoriously uh, brittle bumpers. These two little silver bezels. Now I think these, the either they took the, the grooves are still there throughout the Aerostar's run. The bezels themselves, excuse me while I, my, I uh, wipe my nose, I'm, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, we're, <laughs> We're doing it live, as a famous uh, news commentator once said. Um, but these little silver trim pieces, I think, were not in the later Aerostars. I believe that was more of a an early thing, and and I do quite like that little um, little tiny bit of chrome on there. I can't tell if these wheels are painted or if they're just it looks like they're painted like a dark silver, as opposed to just their you know natural uh, chrome look, or maybe some are painted, some aren't. Um, looks like we do have a roof rack on this vehicle. I wonder if that's factory. It seems like it probably is. Um, and again, you can just see the, the amazing quality of, you know, the paintwork on this car. Now, again, it looks like it may be another slight bumper correction there. I'd be very curious to know if this is original paint or if this was, uh, resprayed at some point coming back around to your front. We'll see this excellent bat. And this is another interesting thing. Now my Brown Arrow star. On one side, it says Aerostar. On the other side, it says Aerostar XLT, which I've actually corrected. But that is different because I have a quarter panel. I believe my Aerostar was in a front-end collision because the grill is definitely all cockeyed and the front quarter panel has been replaced. So my Aerostar is entirely brown with some sort of like orange and tan pinstriping going on. However, this one quarter panel is brown over gold. So it kind of matches, which is kind of funny. It's also dented right here in the front, which I believe happened during transport, which because I, I could have swore when I first got it, it didn't have that dent. It's been so long now. There's a whole saga, but the car, because it broke down on my, uh, I'm 0 for 2 now trying to drive our stars home from purchasing them. That was a very ambitious uh, drive. I was trying to make it back from Georgia. Car broke down, eventually had to have it towed um, because I couldn't find a transmission anywhere down there. Uh, yada, yada, yada. But uh, I don't, I think that, I think they dented it in transport because I really do not remember that dent being there. Anyways, I, I want to get a, eventually I would like to either paint or find a, a, you know, correct matching quarter panel and make the car look, you know, completely brown as it was supposed to and get the pinstripe on there and maybe even just like paint it myself. Doesn't have to be perfect, but that would make sense why the logos are different because they probably just took that quarter panel from an Aerostar that was an XLT and, or an XL. And that's why it says it here because these quarter panels are matching. I, can't see why they would brand it as an Aerostar. And I love that it's on both sides too, but I can't see why they would brand it as just an Aerostar on one side and on the other side, brand it as an XLT. And actually the closer you look, it almost looks like, I know maybe this is just the light, but it, we're doing a little bit of Aerostar sleuthing here. It almost looks like this panel is a little bit lighter. Um, although the blue certainly matches very well, but this silver almost looks like, again, it could just be the light. I'm wondering basically why one panel says XL or XLT and the other one just says regular Aerostar. Now on my brown one, that would make sense because again, like I said, one quarter panel was taken from a different vehicle. This either uh, they did the same thing where they took another quarter panel and painted it to match or maybe they just only labeled it XLT on one side, which I had never considered. Um, so I would throw that out to you, uh, the viewing public now too. If anyone has an early Aerostar um, that has the badging up front on the quarter panel um, and you have an XL or an XLT, is one, is one panel just regular and the other one, the driver's side panel, have the actual trim level on it. Um, some good Aerostar sleuthing right now. Now, whoo, let's look in here. Okay. I love when the interior kind of matches the exterior. I love this blue interior a lot. Now, this is... <laughs> okay, now, not uncommon. This looks a lot like my tan interior on my 86 Aerostar. You can see it's a little bit dark here in the photo, but you can see all this warping that's going on with these plastic panels. I mean, this is just completely blown out. This whole line right here should just be completely straight, and it's totally blown out. 
So this would be my only argument against this car's price. This would be my negotiating point on this car's price is that, you know, to get this fixed, I think, you know, Ron, the great Ronnie, 1989 Aerostar, I think just got an entirely new interior from a junkyard. And that's what I would try to do um, because to try to like mold and bend this back together would be pretty much impossible, let alone trying to like, you know, affix it to any part of the vehicle. Maybe you could screw it in up here into the roof, but you know, then you're, then you're screwing into the roof and um, that's probably not a good thing. Uh, your headliner, uh, incidentally, looks great, but these molding pieces here, now again, to find one, especially in blue, is going to be very, very near impossible. But, you know, just an aside, if, if you're looking for an absolutely perfect Aerostar, you know, we've seen, we've seen a little, a couple little marks that are going to make it um, ding it just a little bit. You know, all that being said, doesn't bother me. But if you want to negotiate price on this, that would be one of your negotiating tactics. Your carpet looks like it's in decent, not great condition, a little bit of staining. However, your seats do, again, you know, maybe a little bit of discoloration here and there, but overall for how old this vehicle is, quite nice. And I absolutely love the two-tone blue with silver or, you know, white uh, piping here. Um, these, you know, it's funny with these Aerostar seats, Again, they're all very similar, and yet the little sort of perforated dots in here, I feel like this is just slightly different than the seats would become later in sort of like the 90s when you had this interior refresh around 91, 92. So I just love that there's these subtle, slight variations. It's like they were always doing something um, a little different, improving things or just tweaking things as the Aerostar went along, and that just makes it more fun. Um, when you look at the historiography of the vehicle to just notice these little differences. Your armrest looks a little bent there too. I love how the spare tires just, I've put mine under that seat for a long time. So much better than under the vehicle itself. Uh, but certainly, you know, in terms of the color combinations of this vehicle, the outside and the inside matching so closely is very, very cool. If this was just like a um, tan or gray interior, I don't think it would have quite the pop that this blue over silver does. So very, very nice. And again, very 80s. Okay, listen up all you uh, car photographers or people that list cars for sale. By the way, look at all these, uh, you know, Volkswagen, um, you got a transporter there and it looks like you might have a caddy there or whatever their little van is called. Uh, very, I was just in Europe this summer. So seeing all these great like Euro little buses is very fun. And then not to mention, you know, the Aerostar, I think is quite European, um, certainly amongst American minivans, probably, you know, fits the best within the European landscape. So that's kind of cool to see the, the Aerostar. Now, again, thank you to uh, Quirky Garage 1999, who has pointed out that the Aerostar was sold natively in Europe, I believe in France. And you're gonna have to correct me again, I apologize, but um, a couple other places. So uh, I don't think it fared very well from a sales standpoint, but it is cool that it was like sort of this cross continental vehicle and we are going all over the world. Um, talking about uh, the Aerostar. So, uh, as I was saying, if you're gonna take a, a picture of the interior of a vehicle when you're listing it for sale, this is the picture you should take. If possible, get in the rear of the vehicle, behind the front seats, and just get this lovely panorama view. Now, if you have a wide angle lens, that would help. Um, but this is just like, I, I'll probably make this the thumbnail for this uh, video because you could just get to see everything. And, and for the Aerostar in particular, you get to bask in um, sort of the great design of it. Now, th this is the biggest singular change that ever happened to the Aerostar was the interior between 86 and um, 91, I believe. This is how the interior would look. Um, the dashboard and layout were just completely different. You do have this wonderful little Aerostar logo that is in the exact same position as my uh, Bertone, like, like Nuccio Bertone, um, which is the design firm that designed the Fiat X19. Um, so that's very sports car-esque. You have this tiny little glove box. Again, center stack uh, 
<laughs> your I mean these vents are so basic and this panel never fits in this little piece of vinyl correctly like I've never seen one that actually fits in there great so the fit and finish on these things you know uh <laughs> I guess left something to be desired but again I don't know for 1980 Six, 1987 it probably wasn't you know you look at a sports car from the same era it's probably just as bad just sort of like you know body gaps and stuff like that uh it wasn't as precise as it is now with with all the computer um you know aided design that we have um that being said yes there's cars in the 40s and 50s that were better put together than this thing but you know, neither here nor there. Uh, a lovely equalizer here, a giant ashtray. Now this has some sort of auxiliary button. And my, you know, the more I see, I think this might just be an ashtray. <laughs> it's a secondary ashtray. Um, and bearing the lead here a little bit, we also have the uh, the digital dash here, which is really cool to see um, on such an early aero star. My 86 has the analog uh, gauges and also has none. I realize how base model mine is because, and it's standard transmission, so it makes sense, but it has none of these auxiliary functions down here. I'm not even sure what these are. Um, and some sort of toggle switch has been, probably for that back light there, has been added. So again, this is not, um, you know, very similar to our uh, 94 that we looked at. Um, sorry, I'm just going to have to pause and, and uh, edit this out. We'll take a quick commercial break. Nobody does it better. In the new world of minivans, nobody does it like the Ford Aerostar. Nobody gives you the highly distinctive styling, the smooth riding comfort, the engineering innovations of Ford Aerostar for the discriminating... Nobody does it like Ford Aerostar. Okay, and we're back. Uh, rather than just keeping wipe my nose disgustingly, I just went ahead and blew my nose. So hopefully you enjoyed that little uh, brief Aerostar commercial. Um, we were talking about the great digital dash. This is another thing I can't seem, seem to find um, when exactly it was offered first and when it went away. I thought it only started around like 1989, 90, 91. And then by 92, when the refresh happened, um, you know, they, they move funny enough. They moved to, they actually kind of went backwards. They went back to an analog, all analog, um, gauges, a little bit different than the analog gauges in the first, uh, version of the Aerostar interior. However, the digital dash remains a mystery to me when exactly what years exactly it was available and on what trim levels, perhaps someone could fill me in on that. You also have power windows here, and it looks like this is popping out a little bit here. There's a little bit of jank on the, uh, again, sorry, I'm getting so, uh, these little white leatherette things on your um, your map holders, I always think is such a lovely, luxurious touch that's like just often overlooked. Um, but your power windows, <clears throat> power locks, um, this is definitely your upper trim level with your digital dash, your automatic transmission, equalizer, now it has an aftermarket head unit. Um, and uh, power amenities. I can't tell here if it has, I wonder if it has the trip computer. We can look in the next photo to see if it has, I bet it does. Yeah, it even has this uh, awesome trip computer up here too with all sorts of probably like your, your range and your fuel economy and stuff like that. So this really, again, for 1987, this had a lot of features and amenities on it that other cars didn't have. And for like, you know, a vehicle that was simultaneously a cargo van, a bare bones cargo van, the passenger version of it was incredibly well specced out. Also your, of course, your famous headphone gauges back there. Um, so yeah, I mean, just, you know, and we have our, looks like we have our Hanes or our Chilton's um, <laughs> guide right there. That's pretty funny. 86 to 90. Um, we'll go back to this picture because this is lovely. Your giant automatic transmission stock. Again, that would become a column mounted uh, stock after I believe 92 or after 91, I should say. Um, but um, I still think the tallest, uh, the longest uh, automatic shift lever offered floor mounted shift lever offered in a production vehicle. I still, I think that may be accurate. Um, but if there's any other candidates out there, let me know. Moving around great pictures. Um, 
you know, fantastic pictures. I really appreciate that. You really do can take a lovely tour of this vehicle, even across the ocean. Now look at how many blues are, you know, count the total number of blues going on in this color or in this van um, between your seats and your different dash components. And of course your paint work. And uh, then down here, we even get this dark blue. Uh, against your door card, which is more of a royal blue. Again, with these wonderful silver or white little leather um, piping inserts. Uh, all just the, the contrast and colors, it's very, very beautiful. This looks like, what I can't tell here is, is I mean, I'm guessing the steering wheel has to be wrapped. I think the steering wheel, the whole thing would be blue, um, but it almost looks like, I don't know if it's been painted or maybe, you know, maybe it came like this, but it's like this two-tone steering wheel. Anyways, looks pretty cool. I always thought the, you know, you, a lot of people, I don't know. I mean, I guess most Aerostar enthusiasts know this, obviously, but this steering wheel is very rare to me, and I really like it. It's like this very Star Trek piece. It's only a two-spoke steering wheel, and this looks very French or European generally, too, Um and I'm so used to, uh, even though my 86 came first, you're just so used to seeing that ubiquitous um, Ford steering wheel that was in everything. It was in Mustangs, it was in the Mercury Capri, it, uh, the little front wheel drive convertible, not the Mustang clone, but it was in the Mustang anyways. Aerostar, Mercury Topaz. I recently just found out, uh, found this out from watching the great JM on Cars, the great British YouTuber, um, that... In Aston Martin, now I'm forgetting which, all the Aston Martin names I always get confused because they all like sound the same. But um, one of those like sort of legendary 80s Aston Martins, the more boxy ones that just didn't, you know, kind of didn't have a long run, um, kind of forgotten about quite honestly. But um, between, you know, your old school round bulbous Aston Martins and your new school round bulbous Aston Martins, they have these really like muscular boxy Aston Martins. And that thing also carried this really expensive Aston Martin carried, um, the same steering wheel as found in the second, you know, the facelifted interior of the Aerostar and so many other Ford products. I think this is when Aston Martin was probably in business with Ford or outright owned by Ford. Um, and so I thought that was very, very funny to see like my Aerostar steering wheel in an Aston Martin. But that's not even the steering wheel that we're looking at here. So I guess neither here nor there. Um, but, but certainly this is, you know, the thing I like about it, it leaves a ton of room up here to see your gauges. Nothing is obstructed. So that's like from an ergonomic standpoint. Of course, you do have your cruise control um, and your horn. Uh, so there you go. A cool looking steering wheel looks great in blue. Again, we have your trip computer. I'm going to get a better, better shot here. So yeah, so average econ, instant econ. I mean, this is these are features that are, you know, fairly well are very normal now to watch your instant economy i feel like with the rise of hybrid cars especially like seeing your real your real-time fuel economy kind of became a thing um but your average speed your distance resetting your engine um you know controls you have like these lights up here the fuel use dte i'm not even sure what that means instant econ average econ I, again you know 1986 like this was uh, I, you know, I think the Corvette was lauded in the C4 Corvette, which came out in 84, was lauded for being this like sort of technological tour de force that had the, the, the digital gauges and all that. And I think this, um, the Aerostar, I always kind of compare to the C4 Corvette a little bit because I think it was doing a lot of, um, those similar things. And yet in a car that was probably half the price, you know, a Corvette, a brand new, uh, sports car, um, certainly, certainly not as expensive as it was today, although still a performance, uh, just a bargain all around as a vehicle. But the Aerostar is like this, you know, just all purpose utility vehicle. So that to, so to have the same tech in it as like Chevrolet's flagship sports car, um, pretty darn cool, I think. Okay, what do we have here? Um, some sort of picture of this Aerostar in the snow. Looks like maybe different wheels no same wheels just a darker picture i'm not sure what this means um maybe some sort of uh customs or um i don't know you tell me uh latvian community what exactly this document is uh showing 
And I apologize again for butchering your language. <laughs> um, okay, so there you have it. We'll go back to the beginning here and just take a look at this uh, you know, original picture we looked at. Absolutely stunning 1987 Aerostar. Um, you know, if you were anywhere in Europe, even in America, this would be like a treat to see. But in Europe, especially, you know, rare and very, very cool. And yes, you know, $5,000 is, is in this market. Um, kind of a lot for an Aerostar, although we've started to see them creep up a little bit. I, I honestly don't think it's terrible for what you're getting here because obviously the paintwork looks great. A couple of minor little things here and there, um, but low mileage, great interior. I mean, a really, really cool classic car, a time capsule, and for the price, you know, for for the the bang for the buck of getting attention at a car show or just seeing this on the road, you know, any anytime you like take a double take at something, um, even if it was something like a Ford Aerostar. And, and nowadays, any 80s, 90s car, when I saw, I saw, I saw a Buick Skylark, remember the weird, um, with like sort of the spats on the rear wheels that harken back to the old cars um, at a, a, a concert that we went to not too long ago. And the thing, I, I loved those Skylarks when I was younger, and you just do not see them anymore. So, um, you know, by virtue of that, a lot of cars kind of, and I think there's all these people that are these, I mean, regular car reviews has like the sort of the, that's the cultural milestone on YouTube. Um, but there's so many people out there that just love these sort of normal cars from the 80s and 90s, quote unquote normal. Now, you know, obviously in, in my view, the Aerostar was quite extraordinary and quite uh, in a class all to its, all by itself, even in its heyday, um, even before it was relegated to this like sort of unusual oddball car that that is unique to see nowadays. Um, but, uh, you know, all that being said, I think the Aerostar would be, um, would get a lot of attention um, when people see it because of just how different it is and, and how well the styling is held up over time and um, how cool it is. And it has its detractors and I'm, I'm going to, um, when I have my more, uh, I'm working on, we're also going through a technological shift right now. I'm trying to get a little bit more high tech um, with some software and, and stuff like that. Eventually, when I'm set up to do reaction videos, I think I will take on some of the critics of the Aerostar uh, and make my case for why they are wrong. <laughs> um, so if you are in Latvia or, or anywhere in Europe, generally, um, I think this would be a very underrated classic car purchase, and you would have a lot of fun with it. You would get a lot of looks with it. And it's extremely practical too. I've actually been using my 93 quite a bit lately. I'm trying to drive it more, um, moving stuff around, hauling stuff. Uh, it helped me move this desk that I'm sitting at right now, this extremely heavy desk that I actually got um, from an opera. Um, the Aerostar helped me move that here. And so, you know, as I'm sitting here talking to you about Ford Aerostars, um, that this very uh, thing that we're doing right now has been aided by the the service of an Aerostar. So it all comes back to that. Okay, I'm clearly rambling right now, so it's time to wrap up the episode. Uh, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all your wonderful comments. We had a little flood of new subscribers um, after our last video. So janky do thank you uh, to all the new people here. Um, hopefully you like... Uh, to listen to people drone on about the Ford Aerostar because that's <laughs> what the majority of this channel has been for the past year or so. Uh, we do have some different sort of things in the works and uh, we'll try to cast as broad of a, a net as we can, but certainly uh, at the at the core of everything is the Ford Aerostar and its greatness as a vehicle. So thank you and Janky do thank you for tuning in to another episode of Year of the Aerostar here on Janky AF. Uh, we'll have another one coming for you very soon. I've almost forgotten how to do this. And uh, until next time, janky do thank you.
Okay, and we're back.